All right, so here we see from God's word, Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. It says, let the peace of God. It better be God's peace, my brothers and sisters. It better be the peace that he gave to man at the beginning of the creation. Because that's what's going to last. Let it not be the peace the world offers to you. Let, us, let it not be the, the peace offerings and the peace treaties that the world makes. No, not those. You know what the world offers? And when they say peace, peace, what comes next? Sudden destruction. That's the peace the world gives. So don't, don't embrace the false prospects of peace that sinful human nature will try to make with you at times. No, don't fall for that. Let the peace of God rule. That's everlasting. That has hope. That has purpose and meanings. Let that peace rule in your hearts. It's his grace, his love that we need to reign in our hearts. But my brothers, what is ruling in our hearts today? What's ruling in the hearts of men and women in society? Anger, hate, bitterness, animosity, jealousy. That's what rules. That's what's on the hearts and minds of people. Pleasures and sin and rebellion and disobedience. No, brothers, we need the peace of God. We need his grace to rule in us. So it is God's will from the very beginning for his people to have peace. Colossians 3.15. How about Philippians 4.7? It says the peace of God, which path is all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. What kind of peace? It's the kind of peace that when every person's heart is melting with fear for all the things that are coming upon the earth, God's people can have a smile on their face. When the judgments of God, the plagues of God are falling, God's people can have perfect peace. In the midst of terrible times of oppression. Yes, a storm is coming relentless in all its fury, but we can have peace. We can have hope, and we have to be a, a, a messengers. We have to be the messengers of hope so that we can give to others the peace that only Christ can give. Then how about Isaiah 26? Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, it says, Thou will keep him. What kind of peace, my brothers? Just, just a temporary? Never. We don't want the temporary peace. We want the things that are going to last forever. Perfect peace. Can you imagine that? That's what the world wants. That's what the world is seeking for. The world wants to live in peace, but it's not coming because why? It's God who gives us that. He's the author of peace. He's the source of peace. And when we come to him, when we are in his will, he will grant us the peace that we need so that we could sleep at night. We don't need the medication. We don't need what the world offers to try to get to sleep. We, all we need is just his grace and his love to work in our hearts and lives. It says, he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. What, 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 what's the last thing on your mind before you go to sleep? Come on now. If it's a horror show and a horror movie, then what kind of peace do you expect to have in your life? If it's something earthly, something temporal, if it's just the, the gossip and the, the bitterness of this world, then what kind of rest do you think you're going to have? But if your mind is stayed on him, the prince of peace, the author of peace, when you lay your burdens to him through prayer before you go to sleep, your sleep will be sweeter than the newborn baby. Amen? That's what we need. That's what we need. Let me ask you this. How, how, you want to live on the corner of gloom and doom? You want to live there? You want to buy a house right there, corner of gloom and doom? I don't want to live there. But you know, my brothers and sisters, we have to understand that there's something that creates this chaos. What creates this animosity? 
and division and alienation. I'm going to read it to you from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. It says that at that time ye were without Christ. There's no hope outside of our Lord and Savior. There's no paradise outside of the presence of God. We saw that in the Garden of Eden. When men left the presence of the Lord, they, ent they left perfect paradise. And then they entered into a dark, cruel world full of pain, misery, and heartache. And when we were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope. Brothers and sisters, what creates this type of world where there is no hope? It says, and without God in this world. Listen, my brothers, when people are determined to live a life without God, without law, without justice, without righteousness, you have to be willing to accept the consequences that will come. And what are they? No peace. You choose that you're going to make your own decisions. You're going to make your own life. You're going to do what? You know what? Don't tell me how to live my life. You ever heard that? That's what kids tell their parents. That's what parents tell God. And our decisions have consequences. And the consequences are being realized in our world today. No God, no hope. And when there's no hope, there's no peace. People are losing faith. And that faith causes us to lose hope. And that hope, ultimately, we end up right there on the corner of doom and gloom. Let me read to you John chapter 1. This is our scripture reading. But still the words of Christ still resonate today. And let me tell you, this is part of the everlasting gospel. This is part of earth's final warning. Let not your heart be troubled. He gives us four reasons. Christ here gives us four reasons. We're going to look at them very quickly. Four reasons why we can have a life without all the chaos, with all the doubt, without the trouble. And the first reason on how we can have an experience where our heart is not perturbed and troubled, where nothing disrupts us, nothing moves us, Nothing separates us from the love of God. The first thing he says is, believe in God. There's, there, that's where it all starts with. Why, why do we have to believe in God? Because it says in the book of Genesis 1, verse 1, the first four words of the Bible, you know what they are? In the beginning, God. That's the first four words. I love those words. In the beginning, God. And guess who's going to be at the end? God. Guess who needs to reign throughout the beginning and the end? God. Guess who was there at your birth? God. And God forbid, you know, that we have to close our eyes and sleep in Jesus, but guess who's going to be there when that happens? God's going to be there. And then if you're faithful, guess who's going to be there to greet you in the morning of the resurrection? God will be there. And guess who you will spend eternity with? God. That's the hope we have. We're not alone. Believe in God, Jesus says. Remember where you come from. Remember your creator. Remember that you were created for one purpose. To be filled with his presence. To be in perfect communion with him. That's why you were created. God formed you. He made you for a glorious purpose. And unless we find our peace and our rest and our purpose in him, listen, there's nothing in this world that will give you the 
the, the full sense of satisfaction in life. And you know, it's unfortunate, it's sad, it's tragic that people will find all kinds of stuff in this world to fill their lives with. And it will never fill. It will never satisfy. Stuff will never do it because we're spiritual. We're created to be filled with him. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You ever read that one? You don't belong to yourself. You are the temple of God. And we will never find our rest and peace until we find it in our God. But what else does it say? That's the first thing. You, you want to be in a point where your heart is in trouble? You, you want to have an experience? Do you want to experience those words, let not your heart be troubled? First thing is, your creator. Believe in that creator that we have. Second thing is, you believe in me. Second thing, you believe in God. Second, believe also in me. There's a second one, Christ. You know, many times when Jesus was preaching, many times uh, the Pharisees, you know, would come in and resist. They would contradict. They would oppose. They would just try to create confusion. They would ask sarcastic questions. Anything to disrupt his preaching of truth. They would do that often. And in one occasion, in the Gospel of John chapter 8, I believe it's verse 24. He tells them, you know, Jesus had to stop and he had to just, you know, sometimes you just have to, you just have to get right to the point, right to the fact. Sometimes you have to quit beating around the bush and just get right to the root of the matter. Sometimes you have to just lay the ax at the root and let the chips fall wherever they need to fall. And he told them, listen, he stopped them and he said, listen, if you don't believe that I'm the one, you will die in your sins. He told them the truth. They were resisting. They were unsure. They were casting doubt. And unless you believe that he's the one who God sent to save us from our sins, Jesus says, you will die in your sin. My brothers, let me tell you, that's the worst thing that can happen to anyone. The worst thing that can happen to you is for us to die in our sin. You know, I just came from prison this morning and I told a group of men, I said, the worst thing that happened to you is not coming here. Maybe for some, if it'll change your life, this is the best thing that's happened to you having to come here. I said, but this is not the worst thing. The worst thing is to die in our sin. Because when you die in your sin, listen, it's over. No future life, no resurrection. Well, yeah, the second resurrection, right? The second resurrection, that's not the one you want. Let me tell you, my brothers, if you wake up from the resurrection and you see a large city, you know, before you and billions of people around you, that's not, that's not a good place to be. You don't want to resurrect and see the new Jerusalem. You want to resurrect and see Jesus coming in the clouds of glory. That's the resurrection. That's the first resurrection. So yes, my brothers and sisters, we have to recognize and realize that, listen, if we die in this world and we are outside of the grace, outside of a relationship with Christ, there's nothing in this world that's going to help you. It's going to save you or that will be of any benefit for us. All the things that we have, if we don't have Christ, will be a curse to us. It will not save us. It will not give us any advantage when the day that we stand before him. But what else did he say? There's a second thing. Believe in God, believe in me. Notice, I go to prepare a place for you. There's the next, you want hope? Believe in this promise. He left to prepare a place. Let me tell you, that place is not here in this earth. You don't belong to this world. You are not of this world. This is not your home. And I don't care if you, I don't care if it's, uh, 
I don't know, pick the most beautiful place in the world. You pick it. That's not your home. Because it's going to end. And it's all going to burn up when Christ comes. The new Jerusalem's your home. A city founded by God, that's your home. He went to prepare a place for you. That's the hope we have. You see, when, when you see what's happening in the world and what they're doing in the world and, and the possibility of a nuclear holocaust, it's comforting to know this is not my home. When you see the prices and you see the inflation and you see the crime, it's comforting to know this is not going to last. We have a, something greater coming. And then here's, here's, you want more hope? Here's more hope right here. And if I go, did he go? Did he leave? Yes. If I go, what's the next part? I will come again. Praise the Lord for that. God has not forgotten us. Sometimes we say, but Lord, do you know how bad it is? He knows, he knows. And his message is, let not your heart be troubled. Keep your faith strong in God. Remember me. This is not your home. I'm coming again. And lo notice, notice. And we will receive you unto myself that where I am. Where's that? With his father in heaven. There you may be also. Oh, my brothers, listen. God is more desirous to save you than you're willing to be saved. God is more desirous to, to rescue you from this world than you're willing to be rescued. God wants to take you to heaven more than you want to go to heaven. Sometimes we think, yeah, we want to go, but listen, he wants you to go even more. He desires for you to be with him even more. And what this means, what this means, my brothers, is that there is a much more glorious life to come. There is a home, as, as uh, Brother Montana sang so eloquently. Don't, don't ask me to sing like that. But as he sang, Beyond the Blue, right? What, what was the, what's the title of the song? Beyond the Blue. My brothers, listen, there is a home beyond the blue. There is a great reunion, family reunion, coming very soon. And a place is being prepared. And because of this, we can experience the words, let not your heart be troubled. But now notice this. This came out June 6th. I believe today's the 8th, right? It better be the 8th because I don't want to be in the wrong place, the wrong church. But on June 6, two days ago, notice this. My brothers, let not your heart be troubled. We have nothing. Listen, praise the Lord, you and I. What this means for us, it means that Jesus is coming soon. That's what this means for us. But if you don't have this hope, you're going to have nothing but fear and anxiety will consume you. Notice what this says. Two days ago, Russian naval ships including nuclear power submarines. Yes, they are coming to Cuba, which is right at the borders of the United States, 90 miles from the United States. They're coming into this territory. Now, what, what happened? Why is this happening? Notice what it says. A group of Russian naval ships, including a nuclear powered submarine, will visit Cuba. Next week, as part of a, now listen to this, historically friendly relationships. My brothers, don't believe everything you hear. Historic friendly relationships. Well, then are they bringing flowers and chocolates? No, they're not bringing flowers and chocolates. They're not bringing pastries and balloons and cute teddy bears. No, my brothers. They're bringing the heat, you know, packing the heat. The biggest heats this world's ever seen. It goes on to say, Cuba announcement comes. What, what triggered this? 
Cuba's announcement comes days after President Joe Biden gave Ukraine permission to carry out limited strikes inside Russian territory with American munitions. You know what that means? We gave the green light to, yes, you can send bombs into Russia. Our bombs, our weapons that we are giving to you, you can use them inside of Russia. My brothers and sisters, that causes, listen, pray about every decision you make in this life. Let me tell you why. Because the decisions we make have consequences. You choose to live a life outside of God, expect no peace, no hope, no joy. But if you choose God to be the foundation, then he will grant us the peace and the joy and the hope that this world can't seem to figure out. So it goes on to say, notice, President Vladimir Putin said, listen to this, Western countries supplying weapons to a conflict zone is always a bad thing. In the end, if we see these countries becoming involved in a war against us, what they are doing makes them directly involved in the war against the Russian federations. We reserve the right to act the same way. My brothers and sisters, you, you know what this means? Well, first of all, praise the Lord that the fate of this planet and the fate of your destiny is not dependent in the hands of any man. Praise the Lord for that. We, our future doesn't depend on any of those things. Praise the Lord for that. But what this is saying is, listen, let me, let me uh, interpret what this is saying. This is saying, or Russia is saying, a nuclear war is not something that you, you in America, should be gambling with. You shouldn't be playing with this. And you know, brothers and sisters, that's absolutely right. In the event, did you know, if not for the intervention of God, if God was not on the throne setting limits to how far men could go, if it wasn't for God, a full-blown nuclear exchange between United States and Russia, you know what would happen? Instantly, there would be millions of people would just die. Instantly, millions. But then, but then, in the nuclear winter, which means in the aftermath of a nuclear war, hundreds of millions of more would die from starvation, no food, no water, no shelter, no nothing. Hundreds of millions more would die. So yes, these are things that we should, as nations, avoid. But unfortunately, you have people on both sides that are just escalating. They're pushing. They're trying to bring us to the brink of total annihilation and destruction. Who's behind it, my brothers? Who's behind it? You know who's behind it. You know who's behind it. The Bible says, it did, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, for the devil has come upon you having great wrath, because he knows. What does he know? He knows that he has but a little while. He knows that Jesus is coming. He knows that his kingdom is coming to an end. So he wants to take as many people to the grave with him as he can. But praise the Lord that your destiny and your future does not depend in the minds. Can I say madmen, madmen? Can I say madmen with huge egos? I don't know what, you, you know, the average Russians and the average Ukrainians and the average Americans, we just want to live peaceful lives. Did you know that? Did you know that 99% of the world, they just want to move on with their lives? They just want to try to survive? 
They want to live peacefully, but it's just a few individuals that are trying to mess it up for anybody. Have you ever heard the phrase, have you, you know, it's, it happens all the time here where it's always someone who just messes it up for everybody else, you know? Usually it's like they, a company or a job allows privileges until one person abuses everything and then everyone loses a privilege. My brothers, we have a few actors, just a few individuals that are trying to mess everything up. All right, here's another one, very quickly. This came out May 31, this is last week. What happened last week? It says Google Cloud error. Now, let me tell you about Google Cloud. Google Cloud is, these are platforms, they're online tools that the banks and corporations use to store all the data. That's, that's what the clouds are. They don't keep them in files. You know, there's no manual files anymore. Your, your bank accounts, all your uh, applications that you do, all the paperwork, listen, nobody keeps files anymore. There's no metal files and then it's, what's your name again? And they look up the file and then they pull out your envelope and then they have all your bank information in there. No, brothers, they keep it in these uh, cloud systems, digital. It's a digital economy. You heard of the digital wallet? Have you heard of the digital wallet? What's that? That means you take your phone, right? And then you put your phone up against the, whatever the computer and then you just pay for your expenses. It's all digital now, brothers. Digital wallets, digital economy, digital money, digital ID. Well, there's a problem. They say that the digital system is gonna make life so much more easier for everyone. Not this, not in this case. Google Cloud error erased $135 billion in pension funds. It didn't help these people. Well, who was it? Who was responsible? Was it the Chinese? Was it the North Koreans? No, it was the same company. Listen to this. Earlier this month, Google's cloud platform deleted the entire customer account, including some backups. The backups too? Come on. I mean, what's the purpose of a backup? In case your file gets deleted, you got the backup, right? But then why have a backup if you're gonna delete everything, including the backups? What's, what's going on, my brothers and sisters? What's going on? It goes on to say, fortunately, you know what, we have to add the words, fortunately, this time. That's what we have to word. We have to add that. Fortunately, this time. This time they were able to retrieve most of it. How about next time? Huh? How about next time? Fortunately, of the 135 billion Australian pension funds, notice it, it affected 647,000 people. What about these people? Some of Eunice Super's backups. Some, not everybody. Some backups on Google's cloud servers and elsewhere were salvageable. Notice what it says, the last sentence. An inadvertent misconfiguration. What was the problem? Misconfiguration. My brothers and sisters, listen, my phone's always misconfigured. My computer's always misconfigured. I got kids, I don't know, maybe you, you don't know what that means. I have kids and they misconfigure everything I have. And if you have a digital wallet and, you, and for some reason the, the update doesn't install right and it misconfigures, guess what's gonna happen to your wallet? What could happen? It can wipe out everything you got and you can lose everything. And don't blame your kids. Don't blame your kids because they were touching your phone. No, it's this whole digital system that is vulnerable, my brothers and sisters. It opens up all kinds of problems. Forget about losing everything. No privacy. And most importantly, listen, why is this important? 
because Revelation chapter 13 says that soon those who do not receive the mark of the beast will not be able to buy or sell. That means all cash has to disappear. As long as you have cash under your mattress, no one can stop you from doing business with somebody else. But if everything is, you know, this digital wallet where you have to do this, you most better believe that they can control everything that we do. And this is necessary. You want prophecy to be fulfilled? You have to have this. The whole world has to go 100% digital. It's coming. And we are there. Okay, we have time for just one more. Here's our last one. We're going to close after this. Look, watch this. You may say, finally, Andy, finally, you bring us some good news. Finally, Andy, you bring us some good news. Listen to this. This, this is our last one. Listen to this, my brothers and sisters. It says, ultra processed foods, not processed foods, not just processed ultra processed foods what does that mean ultra processed foods i mean processed foods okay chemicals what's ultra something pretty bad right i i guess ultra processed foods listen do not cause obesity says u.s government's top diet advisors that picture came with the ad with the article i didn't i didn't find the picture myself that's the picture that came with the article. And what are they talking about here, my brothers and sisters? What are they talking about? You know what they're talking about? They're talking about chocolate covered donuts. Now, maybe the kids ought not to listen to this part. And maybe some of you brothers need to just pray about this one. They're talking about chocolate donuts, brownies, cheesecakes, ice cream, french fries, pizza. You getting hungry? It's almost lunchtime. They're saying that has nothing to do with obesity. It says ultra processed foods demonized for years for their supposed effects on our waistlines. It's all fake news, they say. It says they do not actually make people fat. They don't make you fat. That's not, gonna, that's, not, that's not a problem for your health. You can have it all. My brothers and sisters, who, I, I wanna, I, I, my question is who wrote this? You know who I think wrote this? I think it was the ultra processed food companies that wrote that. That's who I think wrote it. And you know, you, know who, you know who applauds this? You know who says amen? You know who says that? All the pharmaceutical companies that have high blood pressure pill for you and that have, uh, what else? What else, the, the sugar, what's it called when you have a sugar problem? Di the diabetes medication and all. Listen, the pharmacies are saying, Yes, that's not a problem because we have a pill for all the chronic diseases that are going to come if you live this lifestyle. Amen. My brothers and sisters, you know, what's the difference between those who want to bring a nuclear holocaust? Uh, what's the difference between that and those who want to profit off the misery and the pain and the suffering of a sick, chronic disease people. What's the difference? It's a racket to try to see how, see, here's the thing. If you're healthy, they can't make money off of someone who's healthy. But if you have a lot of problems, oh, listen, there's a lot of profit they can make off people who are sick. You know, God has given us a health message. And that health message doesn't say you can, you can have your, what, what's the saying? You can make your, have your cake and eat it too? No, my brothers. God's ways, listen, if, we, if we're obedient to his commandments, we won't have any of those issues. And listen, I got, we, you know, 
you know, can I just show you the, the experts? It says that it says here that it was the government, U.S. government's top advisors on health. Can I can I show you the experts who are telling us this? Can I show you the experts on health? The greatest health experts here in America. Here they are. Those are the health experts. Those are the ones telling us it's not a problem. You can have all those things. Now, listen, if they showed, you know, if they showed uh, somebody who was, you know, like Arnold Schwarzenegger with, you know, the muscles and lean, maybe I would listen. But no, brothers, no. My brothers, listen, we, we, need, to, we need to pray for them. We need to pray for our leaders. We need to pray for our brothers and sisters. We need to pray for people who, who are suffering because of health ailments. We need to pray for our churches. We need to pray for our divided families. We need to pray that the peace and the love and the joy and that the image of God can be restored in each one of us so that when Christ comes, we can leave this world and enter a world where there is no more pain, no more suffering, no more death, and most importantly, a world where Jesus himself will be there with his people. That is what we need to seek. That is a hope that we have. And yes, in spite of all the challenges and difficulties, listen, we have the hope and the promise that we do not have to allow our hearts to be troubled. We can have our hearts full of joy, full of passion, full of love, full of evangelism to see souls saved for what is about to happen. Let's bow our heads. We thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. We thank you for your leading, for your guidance, for your truth. We thank you, Lord, that you have addressed all the issues, not just the issues, you know, in our social relationships, but issues on health and issues on peace and families and homes. Lord, you have addressed all those things. And if we would but just heed your word, Lord, we can avoid all the pain and pitfalls that we see in this world. Help us, Father, to stay close to you. Help us to follow you. Help us to have a greater love and a devotion and desire to serve you. We thank you and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.